What's going on? What is going on? Jordan? Mm. Uh, mm, I don't know. I couldn't think of anything fast enough. Well, you know but what? This is the Macabre, <laughs> <laughs> the Macabre Podcast Universe. I'm Jordan. And I'm Micah. We're married. We are married, and and at, so we're recording this quite a bit in advance because we're about to we're on maternity leave right now. Awesome from the pod, but um, apparently, according to the due date, we had a baby last Friday. Okay, and and to. On on uh or on last Saturday, so we're that far ahead. Well, we oh, did. Oh, never mind. I know we, what's happening. We jumped a couple because we needed yeah. a break from X Men. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so that's what's going on with us. If you want to talk about this episode with us, we're probably going to be a little preoccupied, <laughs> and we probably won't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but yes, earlier this year we covered. Well, wait, what is this podcast? This is the Macaw Podcast Universe. Yeah, we exist to prove people wrong when they say... Sequels are never better than the originals. Mm -hmm. We cover film franchises. We go through them one movie at a time. And earlier this year, we did the Man With No Name trilogy. Sergio Leone and Clint Eastwood. And when we finished that, we thought, we need a little more Clint Eastwood. Yeah. So we went to his other series, which is, of course, Dirty Harry. Yeah. Um... A decidedly different series, but a not so different performance. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Yeah, no, yeah. Just kind of an indelible, I don't even know what that word means, but an indelible, <laughs> like, could you imagine anyone else as Dirty Harry? Exactly. Now, we're going to talk about several actors who almost became Dirty Harry. Okay. And it is wild. Okay. Knowing the movie we saw. But before we do that, I would like to know your history with Dirty Harry. I will say pretty much they're all my first time. However, this is a, a franchise that anytime it was on TV, my dad would continue to flip back to the channel to watch it. Yeah. Okay. So I've seen several bits and pieces of these movies. Uh -huh. um, I guess I probably have seen so little of this one because most of my memory of Dirty Harry is the later movies when Clint Eastwood like, his hair looks very different. Okay. Like he looks older. Okay. Um, so that's kind of my, <laughs> my basis for dirty Harry is, uh, Clint Eastwood's hair. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I've seen this movie one other time. Okay. Um, have you seen all these movies? This is the only one I've seen. Okay. Um, uh, my dad bought the combo pack when I was a kid and he only made it to the first one. Yeah, I, I, the first time I watched it, I was not crazy about it. Oh, okay. I think, I think, uh, I think it was probably late high school, I would imagine. And I think it was in the zone where I was awakening my cinephile esque. So you're snobbery, just say it. Yeah, yeah. And so I think this one was grouped under like, oh, it's just a dad movie. Did you know about Zodiac stuff when you saw this? I didn't know about the Zodiac stuff. Do you stuff. think if you had, you would be a little bit more interested? Uh, I, at the time, or, wait, I don't wait, know. Wait, wait, this is the real question. I'm sure this is what would have happened, though, because you, Micah, would not know about Zodiac if not for David Fincher's Zodiac. Let's be real. Yeah. So I don't like true crime unless it's adapted into a movie with fictional exactly. actors playing it. So... If you had known about Zodiac, you would have seen that movie. Therefore, you would be comparing that movie to this movie the whole time and being like sticking your nose up, Probably. pushing your glasses up on your face and saying, oh, David Fincher did it so much better, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong. <laughs> One thing <laughs> I that's... I I knew you back then. <laughs> One thing that is nuts, though, is um, I just remember, I feel like I was maybe a freshman or an eighth grader, and I had some DVD... And there was a trailer for Zodiac, a movie that came out, I think, when we were seventh graders. Okay. So, because um, I think it came out in 2007. Okay. So, so yeah, it's probably in eighth grade. And I saw the trailer, and I was like, what is this movie? Like, the, the trailer actually kind of scared me. Yeah. Because of what they're dealing with. And I was like, this has got, you know, I think at the time I'm like, this Iron Man guy. And then that one guy from Bubble Boy that I know who he is, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I was like, this looks like... This looks like it good and intense, but but thinking like, oh, but I haven't heard anyone talk about it, so it's probably not good. I, I think for me, for that movie, I didn't like fully sit down and watch the whole thing until college. Yeah. Because that's kind of when I got into Fincher. It was yeah. probably like 
it was probably everybody has to be a freshman in college. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I actually no, I did see. I was aware of Fincher before Gone Girl because I had seen Social Network before. Then I think it's possible though I saw Gone Girl and read Gone Girl, and I was like, "Why?" Well, I know David Fincher didn't write Gone Girl, but it was like, I got to figure out this Fincher guy. So I probably well, by the time Gone Girl is out, you're away in college. I know, and and I have watched all of his movies, and I'm sure I'm obsessively talking. So to I'm you about thinking, it. I like my guess is the summer before uh-huh. Gone Girl came out, I went through Fincher. That's my guess. That makes sense. Um, so that that was me catching up on a lot of those movies I hadn't seen, including yeah. Zodiac. And when I saw Zodiac, it was like, holy crap, this is one of the best movies I've ever seen. I still love that movie. Yeah. And I've since read the book. The book is very fun. Well, it's not fun. It's a great book. Yeah. Um, And I remember watching that movie in college with my friends because we wanted to watch something spooky. Yeah. And um, the scene where... The woman, the trucker picks up the woman with her baby. Oh, oh well, no, she's on the side. Of, no, no, no. Yeah. He, he, he yeah. like does something to her car. He helps her out, does something to her car. She can't go anywhere. He offers her a ride. Yeah. And he, it's like, there's no music in the scene yeah. at all. And he just tells her, I'm going to throw your baby out. Like, I'm going to kill you and throw your baby out the window or something like that. And it is so scary. And I remember yeah. watching it with my friends and we were all just like gripped. Yeah, with fear. It was so scary. I mean, I I think I think you and I both have kind of simmered on Fincher a little bit. Yeah. Um, and that's a little unfair because everybody can make a bad movie. We're talking about Mank, folks. Um, we also didn't like Mindhunter. Yeah, but I mean that is a show, so yeah. I'm not really counting that against. He's him. heavily involved in it, but sure. I I know, but everybody loves it, so yeah. I think we're like in a small group of people that yeah. didn't like that show. Like when we told people we didn't like it, they were like. Micah and Jordan, you didn't like that show? And it was like, yeah, it was really boring. Uh, but having said all that, um, when when he's at his best, he he's he is like one of the best at making some of the most terrifying things. Yeah. Um, because all of the murder scenes in that movie are scarier than almost any horror movie I've seen. I, I think because they feel so real. Well, and and in that movie, he captures he captures the randomness yeah. feeling of it, where it's like, if you were just around in San Francisco, this guy just might kill you. Yeah, like this random person, not with even no just San Francisco, just the Bay Area. Yeah, because like the he couple that goes on the picnic. Yeah, that's that is so a, scary. That is so gross. That scene. It gives, it gives you a pit in your stomach. I also yeah. remember. Um, and and the obsession of Jake Gyllenhaal, like yeah. like you you're wanting him to solve it. And then, like, if you're like me, I didn't know the Zodiac Killer. So it gets to the end, and I'm like, they didn't find this guy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then also my obsession with Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah. Period. Um, <laughs> I also remember with my friends from college uh, yeah. wanting to watch a scary movie again. And I, I'm like, guys, let's watch this movie, Seven. Oof, but yeah, like, yeah. Th- th- this is truly a very scary movie. And I was in New Hampshire at my one of my friend's houses for yeah. the weekend. On my laptop. Yeah. For trying to watch it's it. It's a different time. Uh, so not only was it just the worst medium to watch it, but... Uh, I watched a torrented hangover on my iPod when it was <laughs> still in theater. So, you know. They're so bad. But I, I, we did not make it very far because I think no one was going to admit it, but it was too disturbing. Yeah. I, I like, kind of thinking we got through the glutton, like the beginning of the movie. Oh, yeah. And it was like, oh, it's that kind of movie yeah let's just go to bed yeah yeah that movie really freaked me out when i saw i was in high school and like his whole speech about god just really got under my skin when he's when they're driving to the final destination i don't remember what he says he well he's basically just talking about like the anger of god and justifying his violence and all that stuff and it just really got under my skin and it was like hard for me to sleep that night yeah um, but yeah, that's when David Fincher's at his best. And Jordan, do you know about his recent, his, his next movie? He's par- he's teamed up with the seven guy again. Yeah. So the writer of seven. Yeah. Um, I can't remember his name. I feel like it's Kevin Wilkinson, but that might be wrong. Um, and then here's, it's going to be a big test because you and I are kind of off Fincher, but it's a return to, you know, the killers. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's called the killer. Okay. Um, it's original, right? Yeah, it's, he's with the seven guy, 
And here's the other test. This is going to be the true test. I'm nervous. That we started and we talked about in first class. It stars Michael Fassbender. Huh? Oh, I. so they saw they saw the snowman. Movie. And they were like, let's do this right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's give him another chance because for some reason we just like keeping, we like giving Michael Fassbender second chances. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's going to be like the test on if we're still invested in Fincher and if we can be converted into like officially putting Fassbender in the like great category. Oh man, that, that's, A I have like, I have like that. absolutely no idea where to put my expectations. Yeah, I don't know. You know? They're high, though, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I do fear, I think, I think it might be a Netflix movie. Oh, well. Which, he still has creative control. Like, his shows and stuff still look like his stuff. But uh, I just hate when a big director has to premiere a movie in a living room. Yeah. So like they won't even do theaters, you think? Netflix hates the theaters. Yeah, but you don't think they'll do it for, like, a weekend like they did with Glass Onion? They might. Okay. But... But with adult dramas, they're usually not so keen on doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Scorsese's got Killers of the Flower Moon coming out this year. Which, on with the, Apple. On Apple with a reported runtime of three hours and 20 minutes. Gibby, gibby, gibby. Yeah. I mean, we saw that still. And uh, I did not know that this was his next movie. Uh-huh. Um, and it just, the, 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 the still image and then reading the tiny description, it's like, oh, he made a movie for me. Uh, yeah, That's yeah, I know. Feels. I I am so excited for that. He's reteaming with Caprio. Yeah. Um, by the time this episode comes out, I'm sure there's trailers for both of those movies. Yeah. And I'm sure it'll be pretty exciting. Um, but all of that to say, I don't know if we would be getting these types of movies if it wasn't for a movie from 1971 called Dirty Harry. So I'm going to tell you the story of how this movie came to be. Okay. But actually, before that, I do want to say... That my dad, and dad, I love you very much, but I gotta put you on blast for this. Um, he thinks that he's really good at two impressions. And one is John Wayne, and the other is Clint Eastwood as Dirty Harry. And I, I think that that goes across the board with American dads in, like, sure. across the country. Yeah, I think all of them think they can talk like this, like John Wayne. <laughs> and they all do that. And it's like, you don't, you kind of sound like him. And then everyone's like, go ahead, punk make my day and it's like yeah i guess <laughs> yeah uh so uh i grew up with my dad quoting these movies i would say probably every day probably every day he i'm would, not surprised by that so he would do the he would do the um 44 magnum you know how many shots thing that we're gonna go through yeah. in this movie and then in a later movie i think he says a man's just got to know his limitations and my dad says that to this day, all the time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I think I, I think that's probably another reason why I watch Dirty Harry, and I'm like, yeah, it's whatever, because I'm I like, I I've it. grown up with this man, like, and and you know, there, there's this thing that happens, and where like something is quoted so much, and it's not just him, but like people quote the uh, "Make My Day" punk, yeah, line all the time, and if you never are familiar, you know you feel with unlucky. Or are you feeling lucky? I'm sorry. Um, my dad's like about to call me right yeah. now because he's like, you said the wrong thing. <laughs> but um, it's so so anyway, like that always um, l like when you're exposed to not the original source of something, it uh -huh. can like pervert how totally. it feels. Yeah. So when I watched this, I was like, oh, it's way less dramatic than I thought this was. Yeah, like it, at, at that age, yeah, I do like, think it now watching it, it's pretty dang dramatic. No, it is, but, but like I know what you I'm mean. used to my dad mean. being like, "Go ahead, punk." Well, well, it's like make the, my day. It's, it's <laughs> like I this is more this movie like that is more dramatic than my example, but it's like anyone who finally watches Taxi Driver. That was what I was gonna say. Yeah, yeah and the the are you talking to me? Uh, line from yeah. Robert De Niro is so subdued. I know it's, are you talking to me? Kind of like yeah. that was a more accurate impression than when, then everyone's like, oh, you, t they're doing like Tony Soprano. They're like, <laughs> yo, you talking to me? Oh, huh? <laughs> mama mia. Um, I got to be careful. I got a show tonight. I can't ruin my voice. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. So that's a funny thing about this movie and growing up. Now, 
Uh, there's a few writers on this movie, and there's a guy named Harry Julian Fink and R.M. Fink, and they're married. Um, and so Harry Fink worked on uh, t- the, this TV western, Have Gun, Will Travel, and his wife and he worked on Big Jake and Cahill U.S. Marshall, and they were wor- they worked on this screenplay. They had this idea. It was originally called Dead Right, and it was about an aging New York detective named Hen- Harry Callahan who faced burnout in the late 50s but became obsessed with stopping a serial killer named Travis who was preying upon the city in the original version. It wasn't even Harry who took the bad guy out in the end. So a completely different movie. Pretty different movie. But they start pitching this movie, and they had written it for a specific actor. Again, this is crazy. Um, and they Is it a op- Western guy? It's Mr. Western himself. John Wayne? They wrote this specifically for John Wayne. Oh, that's weird. And I just can't see it. I can't see it at all. Um, and they offered the role to John Wayne. And he was like, this is way too violent. I I will not be a part of wow. this. Wow. Okay. Because, you know, as much as we all love John Wayne, he was definitely a prude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Famous, a famous prude. And and someone who turned in a lot of people during the... Uh, oh, the um, blacklist days. Yeah, yeah. With writers and stuff like that. So I, I always have a hard time with John Wayne because he basically kind of sucks politically um he's a tattletale yeah but i mean that doesn't necessarily reflect reflect his movies but anyway so they offer the role to john wayne and he says it's too too violent and the the script enters development hell and then uh universal gets the rights um and they think clint eastwood would be good but nobody takes him up on that Hmm. nobody talks to clint um and then uh well, no, Universal had the rights. They suggested that. And then it goes to ABC TV. Okay. And they're like, hey, let's make a TV movie out of this. Okay. Which, again, that's crazy. Yeah. Like, think of the alternate universe where this is just some TV movie. Yeah. Um, and then the rights are sold to Warner Brothers. And Warner Brothers goes, okay, we got it. John Wayne's not going to work, but we got the guy, the perfect aging, dirty, hairy Mr. Blue Eyes himself. Mr. New York, New York, Frank Sinatra. Let's no get him way. in the movie. <laughs> so they start talking to Frank Sinatra. It goes into negotiations. Oh, wow. He is interested in doing this. They bring on Irving Kirshner, the director of The Empire Strikes Back. Okay. They're like, I mean, he hadn't directed that movie yet, but they're like, yeah. this is going to be our guy. And then John Melius, uh, who wrote Apocalypse Now, Yeah. Uh, they bring him on to write. Like, re- rework the screenplay. Yeah. Okay, all right. But also, uh, Frank Sinatra's pretty good, at least in Manchurian Candidate. I actually have not seen him in a movie, I think. I think that's the only movie I've seen him in. Okay. Uh, he's very good in that movie. Really? Um, But I th- I've seen him in something else as well, but it was a very small role. But anyway, um, but he, you know... He, he doesn't strike me as a detective in any no. way, shape, or form. Um, but he turns down the role in 60... Be, uh, he turns down the role because he'd broken his wrist in 1962, and he didn't think he could convincingly use the 44 Magnum. Whoa! <laughs> respect for the gun. And also, his dad had recently died. So okay. all those things in conjunction, <laughs> he was like, I shouldn't do this movie. Is the gun that heavy? Oh, a forty-four Magnum is big. Like, how heavy is it? It's heavy. I, I mean, I'll, I'll look it up. Um, how heavy is a forty-four Magnum pistol? Uh, Fifty ounces. Dang it! What does that mean? I mean, that's a couple pounds. That's a few pounds. You got—he's got that thing flopping around under his jacket the whole time. Yeah. And th- this is just—is a forty-four Magnum revolver enough to kill a grizzly bear? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> Sounds like okay. a question from experience. <laughs> 55 point. Okay. Can you, you just look it up and wow. The, the barrel is 45 ounces. Whoa. So 55 ounces. So 55 divided by 16. What is that? So it's over three pounds. That doesn't seem 55 crazy. divided by 16. Yeah. Three pounds though. And what like for a handgun? 
Yeah, it that's mu- pretty heavy. Yeah, right? it, it's got to be. It's got to. It just doesn't hand sound. Go. Yeah, I guess so. And especially with the barrel being most of that weight, like that's pulling you down. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah. Did but, not know that. But yeah, that thing is heavy. It's intense. So, and yeah, you're holding it out. I imagine it can really mess a person up. Oh yeah, he's not kidding when he says it could blow your head clean <laughs> off. Um, so they don't. He doesn't take it. And then there, there's rumors, but we don't know for sure that Marlon Brando was offered the part. I, I had a feeling you're going to bring up his name. Yeah, which this would have been not a good time for Brando to be no. in it, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, and then they offer it to Robert Mitchell next, and he has a deal um, that the less, or he he had like an internal deal. Okay. That the less he liked a script, the more he would ask for money. What? To like make it worth my time? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. So that was his deal. And he disliked this movie so much that he didn't even give them an offer and said, <laughs> no, I will not do this. Wow. Then they offer it to Burt Lancaster. Okay. Can you remind me who that is? Um, He is the old director in Boogie Nights. And he's also in um, Deliverance. And he's in Smokey and the Bandits. The old director? Okay, sure. Whatever. Um. Famously, he didn't like the movie Boogie Nights. Really? Yeah. Um, because it's about porn? I think so. Then why was he in the movie? I think he just later, I think he was just never on board with the movie while they were filming That's or anything. And he's very good in that movie. What, what character is he? Oh, he said he's, he's the director. He's the director. He's like I the guy that up. brings I them just... all into the scene. He's the one who discovers Mark Wahlberg at the beginning of the movie. Um, Burt Land. Oh, that guy. Okay. Yeah. He turns it down. Well, actually, I don't know what he, he... Maybe it just didn't work out with him. Yeah. Then they talk to Steve McQueen. Okay. That makes sense. That's the... Burt Lancaster and Steve McQueen could have pulled this off. It would have been different. Yeah. Uh, but they, they could have done it. And then they talk to Paul Newman. Okay. And Newman says... I don't want to do it, but I think you should have Clint Eastwood do it. He'd be ah, great for it. Nice. They talk to Clint Eastwood. Clint Eastwood says, I will do it as long as uh, I get to produce it under my company, Malposa Company. Okay. And Eastwood also doesn't like the rewrites that have been made and wants to go back to the first draft and work from there. Interesting. So when do they get to San Francisco? I imagine that's just Zodiac related. Well, uh, I got that going okay. on here, so I'll, I'll let you know. Um so then also Eastwood wants Don Siegel to direct. He's busy working on his directorial debut, Play Misty for Me, so he can't mm-hmm. direct it. Um, like, that's the implication when I was reading this, that maybe he would have directed it if he wasn't busy. Um, but Don Siegel has a contract with Universal, and now the movie's at Warner Brothers. Oh, okay. And he goes to Universal, and he's like, can you just loan him out to us? He's got to be the one to direct this. And Warner Brothers is like, yeah. I mean, Universal says, yeah, he can direct this movie for Warner Brothers. That's really? fine. Really? Um, and so all of that goes on. At one point, Terrence Malick had done a rewrite of the movie. Okay. And uh, uh, he had Scorpio killing wealthy criminals. Okay. But they both didn't like that idea and rejected it. But from the way this was written, it sounds like maybe one of the next movies has that plot. Oh, Okay. Um, so then they hire Dean, what is his name? Dean Reisner to, uh, rewrite the a lot of rewrites. Yeah. But they're going back to the first yeah, yeah, draft yeah. and he uses, well, kind of, cause he uses some of the dialogue from Melius's ver- version and he adds the Zodiac killer element. Okay. So it hadn't even had that element yet. Yeah. Which is kind of what makes this, this movie This is pretty cool. crazy because Zodiac is like, uh, well, as Out we and know, about. Yeah, yeah. He is like currently active. <laughs> yeah. That that's, He's still at large. So I imagine when this movie came out, it had to have been pretty scary. I would think so. Which, going back to the movie Zodiac, in that movie, our characters go and see Dirty Harry in the right. theaters. And, uh, and then... I believe in the movie, Jake Gyllenhaal talks to the lead investigator Mark, at the I premiere. Think Mark Ruffalo, right? Yeah, I think so. And then Mark Ruffalo says something, you know, about the movie being like, well, they're already making movies about this stuff. Okay. You know? um, 
and and yeah, David Tashi, who I think is who Mark Ruffalo is pl- playing, is used as partial inspiration. Wow. Uh, for this movie, and he's the chief investigator on Zodiac. So mm-hmm. I, I think that's Mark Ruffalo's character. Um, and then Eastwood had seen Andrew J. Robinson, the man who plays the killer in this movie, in a stage performance of Subject to Fits and envisioned the actor as the disheveled, psychological, unbalanced hippie that Scorpio becomes. I thought the casting was great on that guy. Guy was good. But Robinson detested firearms, and was extremely... He's the killer. Oh, That's okay. the actor's oh, name. Oh, okay, okay. Um, Andrew Robinson. Okay. Uh, he detested firearms and was super uncomfortable, so the director, like, sent him to, like, training with weapons because wow. he was, like, flinching around them. Wow, interesting. Um, and then he also... It, it just sounds like he was very uncomfortable with all of the bigotry his character has to do. Oh, wow. And, like, the, yeah. the scenes where he's hitting the kids and, like, yelling at the kids. He was, like, very uncomfortable. He still did a, He still did it. Oh, yeah, he was he was scary. But, but you know, it's kind of nice when, when you hear about actors, like, getting so into roles and stuff like that. It, it's nice to hear that there's a guy who'd play something this messed up. And a really, this performance is kind of a modern, like, yeah. serial killer yeah. performance. Yeah. And and to know that he was like I was really uncomfortable doing that. Yeah, is is nice. Yeah, it is. It is interesting because we were kind of talking about this during while watching this movie. Um, like the sixties and the seventies, in a way, felt like hell on earth <laughs> yeah. because serial killers were very prominent yeah. during this time. For I don't know. Yeah, it's just tr- so many true crime things take place during these time periods. This time period, and it's just like. It's almost as if human humankind like reached this new level of depravity that maybe we had we had been there before, but it had never been this prevalent. Yeah. And like so like with Zodiac well, It's just more like undocumented, you know? Because yeah. there's it's not like serial killers just came to be in the sixties and seventies. They were out there. No, yeah. But yeah. But it, it's just there there is like a random acts of violence element yeah. to it that feels like like it's so unpredictable uh-huh. i mean like that that's the interesting thing about mindhunter not just the show but the book where it's like this guy this guy finally sat down and was like l- with all of these serial killers yeah and was like let's try and figure out why do we have these why these people exist yeah like this didn't happen yet no one's yeah. trying to figure out the psyche right. of why someone would want to kill people like right. randomly or because of some like not agenda. acts of pa- or passion. What is that called? A crime of passion yeah. kind of a thing. So to, to like this, I, I just, have, I just feel like this movie had to have been so scary. Like that guy's performance had to have been so scary back then. Yeah. And it's, it continues to be today, but today we're a little bit more desensitized. We're a lot more desensitized yeah. to stuff like that. But it, it's just interesting to look at this in, in the context of the times. Well, and, and looking at, like, U.S. history, like, we've gone through World War II, gone through Korea, gone through the Cold War, and now we're in Vietnam. It's like nothing really makes sense anymore. Yeah. Like, abroad or domestic, and then now there's just, like, people that go around and randomly kill people. It's just nothing in America makes sense. You, and, like, you got to start, start start locking your doors yeah. in your quiet neighborhood. Right. And And it's before, like, the boom of the 80s when, like, our like excess is just like so incredibly over the top. Yeah. So it's like this is the it's a dark time in America. Yeah. It's yeah. not it's not great. And I think this movie kind of reflects that. A big book I would recommend to anybody who Even me. Even you. It is true crime, but oh, boy is it good. That book Chaos. Um Oh yeah, the Don't you dare look it up. I forget. Don't the you, I don't wanna name. edit, Jordan. But it's it's chaos, and it's about the Manson murders. Chaos by Tom O'Neill. Uh, about the Manson murders, of course, the like definitive Manson murders book is Helter Skelter, which I've read. Written by the prosecutor of that case, um, which I, that was like a page turner. It was such an exciting book. Well, as time goes on, and then you read this book, Chaos, you kind of learn why it was so page turning. Uh huh. Because so much of it was made up. Or uh-huh. coerced and convoluted and just like made up. Yeah. So 
I would totally recommend Chaos because it's also it's not just about the Manson murders, but it really gives you a very interesting snapshot into the sixties. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, bef- before we continue with my notes, one one thing that I think is a worthwhile topic of discussion is the politics of this movie. Um, and I've been thinking about this a lot because now, of course, it's a fictional movie. I think that I think too often, especially nowadays with like the Twitterfication of everything, uh, it's easy to just go, this movie has this in it. Therefore, the entire movie is bad. Yeah. But this is a movie that makes the argument that like criminals do not have rights. And if you are a suspected criminal, you don't have rights and you should be treated as such if we're pretty sure you committed the crime. By looking through Clint Eastwood's character's lens? Well, I, I, because he is the he's the protagonist and he's presented as such a cool guy and he is never presented as in the wrong. Yeah. Um and and what what's kind of interesting, and I, I'm just kind of pointing this stuff out. Yeah. Um, one thing that I find interesting is like if you're watching a Batman movie, there's always corruption in the police force. Yeah. Well, except for like the old movies, but like the Dark Knight and this this new one that came out. Yeah, I don't know why people live in Gotham. Exactly. But but the idea is that there is like corruption in the police force, and he he is a vigilante who has to like rise above it because the police are not doing things properly. Mm-hmm. And what's kind of interesting about this movie is the police and the mayor are all doing everything legally and they are, they are not corrupt. Mm-hmm. This is not a corrupt police force from this world. Mm-hmm. And yet in, or, in order to make justice, you have to be corrupted, mm-hmm. which it is a dangerous message that I think we're still like dealing with those ramifications. Yeah. And, he's a gray area character. Yeah. Now, I, I mean, if he is a good nice policeman is this a good movie probably not yeah. so so yeah, don't yeah. don't like misunderstand me audience i'm not saying to throw this movie out with the bathwater but it is kind of a dangerous uh message i mean it's a message that roger ebert said this movie is fascist there's no two ways about it <laughs> in wow. his review wow um but but it also got me thinking about like what i would maybe consider what does that mean what does he mean by that well f- fascist I mean, how I read it to mean yeah. is like just ta- looking at someone and going, you did this thing, therefore you don't have rights okay. and I'm going to take them okay. away from you and I'm going to like, you know, do this stuff. Okay. Now it's very clear that he did commit these crimes. Yeah, know. but because we get to see him do it. That's true. Um, yeah, we don't actually know that he We're not like, we're not waiting the whole movie for them to reveal who the guy is. Right. But what, which, which I think is because like we want, we need to feel that catharsis, the, the, the Clint Eastwood's character is justified in everything. We, right. we need to be on his side the whole time. Yeah. Um, but what I thought of as a good, almost like opposite of this movie that like explores the same politics, but in a, maybe a better way is prisoners. And the reason I bring that up is it has a character like Dirty Harry, which is Hugh Jackman, who is convinced that someone kidnapped his kids, this specific person, and he proceeds to take that person and torture them. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care about the rights. He doesn't care about that. Meanwhile, Detective Loki, played by Jake Gyllenhaal in my favorite Jake Gyllenhaal performance, uh, he is following things by the books. He's getting the warrants. He's frustrated. When he, when like the police chief is telling him to like back off of this case and stuff, but he is doing what he's supposed to be doing, and eventually he finds out the truth. And Hugh Jackman was in pursuit of the lie the whole time, and he didn't know it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, Hugh Jackman's best performance. <laughs> yeah, that would be so good. So it's kind of like these two movies would almost be a, an interesting double feature, oh, exploring yeah. those two aspects. Yeah. That 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 movie is almost like what if it was Dirty Harry, but there were consequences to these actions. Yeah, and he was wrong. Yeah, um, I don't know. D- did you have any any? Th- did that spark any? Th- I threw it on you. I'd been thinking about it for I a little. I haven't bit. been thinking about that. That's very interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, reminder that Prisoners is probably top five movies of the teens. Um, mm-hmm. and I I. Even with Dune, that's that's Denis' best movie. Mm-hmm. It'll be tough for him to ever 
make a movie as good as that. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, he's made several movies as good, but I don't know if they'll exceed it. That's my personal favorite. Yeah. But That's what I have to say anymore about things, because there's so many good things. My right. personal favorite? <laughs> right. That. Um, but yes, now going back to the notes, uh, this movie was very controversial when it came out for its ultraviolence. Yeah. And actually... Even though it's 2023, watching it now as an adult, and hey, I just had a child. Um, I am like, this movie's really violent. Mm-hmm. Uh, it still like hits in that in that same way that like Reservoir Dogs still hits, no matter how many times sure. you watch it. Oh gosh, I recently wa- rewatched that movie. <laughs> yeah, I forgot how. Well, I didn't really forget. It's a Quentin Tarantino movie, right? But well, I you're just, always like, this time it won't be crazy and yeah. then you're watching and he's you're... torturing that cop and <laughs> yeah. it's just like oh my gosh he cuts his ear off yeah what sick i know and not in a good way but kind of in a good way <laughs> no i'm kidding um and then the film also supposedly inspired several real life crimes because there's there's a there's a lot of people after this movie came out who like like two armed men in australia kidnapped six school children what um but they were caught, and then this other guy, kid, like kidnapped a bus with twenty six school children. Um, yeah, the students and driver escaped before the kidnapper could send their ransom demand. And then there was someone who like buried a girl in a what? Because like, of this like movie? It, well, or I, like that's their claim or whatever. Yeah, which you know, I I don't I don't know because so, sometimes it, it's easy to blame. Uh, a movie for like societal issues, <laughs> you yeah. know, we still get that with, I mean, remember when we were kids and it was like, your kids shouldn't play violent video games. They'll kill everybody. Well, it's like your favorite band being blamed for someone killing yeah. himself. Like that, that's happened a lot. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not getting into it, but that's just, that's yeah. happened a lot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I just thought that was worth noting. Um, and then another thing is, of course I was not alive in this time, but it seems like, this has got to be a turning point uh, in cop movies. Well, it is. It is a turning yeah. point in cop movies. And I think probably cop TV, because I'm looking at, like, you have Dragnet in 1951, which was a famous cop show. And then by 1981, you have Hill Street Blues, which is a much more dark, gritty, oh, okay. like, real-life cop thing. And I, and I kind of, I don't know if you get Hill Street Blues if this movie doesn't come out. Oh, interesting. Um, and then as far as... Uh, I already talked about, yeah, Don Siegel. I talked about the people who wrote it. Um, a story by credit goes to Joe Himes uh, and story by also to the original writers of the of it, um, the Finks. And then the cinematography is Bruce Surtees, who did play Missy for me, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, Beverly Hills Cop. And the music is by Lalo Schifrin. And the music to Bravo. this. Bravo. My good sir. So good. It so was 70s. So good. Now let's bring it back. It reminded me of a um Dario Argento movie. Oh oh yes. Because yeah. he's got the craziest he's scores. He's got some funky scores. Yeah. Um well I've only seen one movie, but you've seen two, so And they're crazy. <laughs> I so I was looking at what he did. And he's got Enter the Dragon, Cool Hand Luke, Amityville Horror. But then I see his claim to fame. Oh, I've seen this guy's name before. We've all seen his name before because he wrote the theme to He did? Like originally? Yeah, he wrote the theme to Mission wow. Impossible. So He's good at his job. Very good. The movie comes out 12 23 1971. Uh it has a domestic box office and a domestic release only. Uh, 35.9 million and I was not able to confirm but I believe the budget of this movie was four million dollars okay now hit me with your notes well we've covered Clint Eastwood well but could you fill us in from man with no Nate? yeah just give me a second when did that movie come out that was like the end of the 60s I think good the bad was 69 I want to say okay so since that movie, I actually can't. Oh, okay, yeah. So since Good and Bad and the Ugly, he's been in Hang 'em High, Coogan's Bluff, Print Your Wagon. So several westerns. Paint Your Wagon. 
Uh huh. I'm not wearing my glasses. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's also in Kelly's Heroes. Um, Two Mules for Sister Sarah. Played Misty for me. That's the same year as Dirty Harry. Okay. Um, and then since Dirty, Dirty Harry, he goes on to things like Magnum Force. Which is a Dirty Harry movie. Oh, okay. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. <laughs> huh? Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. No. Thunderbolt and Lightfoot. Well, we, we, I mean, we can fill it in when we get there, right? Yeah. We can keep revisiting okay, him. fine. So he is still the Western icon, but he's about to become the uh, hero cop icon next. Yes. And then Andrew Robinson, like you said, plays the killer. He is also in Hellraiser, um, Star Trek, Deep Space Nine, Child's Play 3. Okay. Um, some Does some voice acting for a Star Trek video game, a computer game, a PC game. Um, and then The Practice, Without a Trace, a lot of TV shows. Okay. Um, looking at Child's Play 3, we can update the listeners. Because uh-huh. I've said that I've never been interested in watching Child's Play. Yeah. Um, Chucky just seems too mean. <laughs> yeah, that was her thing. And, it's always and been my thing. Jordan He's has too been spirited. Now, before we get into the change in spirit here, Jordan has always been the one that's encouraged me to horror. I become a horror yeah. hound. I like to sniff it out, but I like to dig my bones in horror and then bury my bones and then pull them out later and chew on them again and then bury them again. I love my horror, <laughs> but. Uh, I'd been like, hey, we should watch Chucky. That's a classic. And Jordan's like, no way. I can't do it. And, and I'm like, it, I'm sure it's not even He's scary. He's too mean. Like, he seems too mean and, and then, not fun. And then in January, we go and see this movie called Megan. Yeah. Which is fun, fun, fun. I loved it. Uh, it rules. It knows exactly what it is. We love it. And then what happens? And then I, well, I, I feel like We had talked about it with someone on the podcast, too. Someone told us about just more Child's Play stuff. I can't remember. Yeah, that was was probably on our uh, Wes Craven's new nightmare. I remember there was some Chucky talk in that. That kind of, like, maybe opened me up a little bit more. Yeah. But, um, yeah, then on my birthday this year. Well, but but even before that, when we were coming home from Oh, yeah, I was like, you know what? I think I could try it. Well, I to- no, you're getting this. I don't all remember. Wrong. Sorry, jeez. I, I just said, I just said, you know, Jordan, I, Megan was like an updated Chucky. I'm sure we we should just watch Chucky now. And you, as you, we were pulling into our driveway, you were like, I guess you're right. Flash forward to flash forward, fast forward to my birthday night, trying to figure out what movie to watch, and uh-huh. I say, what the heck? Let's just watch Child's Play. Let's do it. Let's finally conquer. Uh-huh. My fear of Chucky. Uh huh. Um, and we watched it, and it made no sense. It is wild. It's, it's bonkers. So fun. Yeah. It's like the animatronic. It's, it's so funny too that you know it's like my thing was always that he was so mean, and he is mean. He he's not having fun. Um, he's kind of having fun. I I I, ima- I like to imagine that he has fun later. Yeah. Because this movie is all about surviving for him. It's a survival yeah. movie for Chucky. Um. So, but but I just, uh, part of me has never considered how cool the animatronics would look. Yeah. And the animatronics are so cool in that movie. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah, it, it, it is, it's, it's just one of those, there's like a mat, there's like a magic type of movie. I'd put Megan in the same category, but like Chucky and like the Gremlins movies where, yeah, maybe they have like story problems or like a character doesn't make sense or something like that. But the the commitment to the bit and every the commitment to everything and then making cool effects is just like I don't really care that like this person was underwritten or maybe like from here to here doesn't make that much sense. It's not there's nothing like a classic horror movie that makes that that has like a female lead uh-huh. that we just don't get uh-huh. like that. And to have the male lead be completely useless. Oh my you gosh. just you just don't He's get it so in any other genre, useless. and it's just always so refreshing. Every single time you're watching a new property, and it's like this guy, he's the detective, and he's doing squat in this movie. I know he, he gets sucks. like he gets like hurt in the leg, and he is completely incapacitated. He's unconscious for scene. the final battle. Yeah, 
And then he wakes up, and then Chucky gets bu- back up from his final battle, and he gets knocked out again. Yeah, he's so useless. <laughs> he was he was so useless. Um, and and don't worry, listeners. We know a lot of you are not horror hounds. You don't sniff it out yet. You will, but you don't yet. <laughs> and we're. I don't imagine we're going to be doing Chucky anytime soon. No, no, no. But it was fun to it was fun to finally watch yeah. it. I think there's too many, and I don't think it's like the Freddy thing. I think it's probably like there's too many, and I think fans agree there's too many. Yeah. You know? Whereas Freddy, there was always something to enjoy. Yeah. Because he's an artist. Yeah. He is an artist. <laughs> he really is. <laughs> and he has fun. He has fun. Oh, yeah. So Harry Guardino plays Bresler. He's the, like, police well, not the chief, but like the lieutenant or something. Um, the guy that's ordering yeah. Harry around the whole time. He's also in The Enforcer, Houseboat, King of Kings, Fist of Honor, Murder, She Wrote, and much more. Um, Rennie Santoni plays Chico, who is Harry's partner. Okay. Briefly. He plays Poppy in uh, Seinfeld. Um, he's also in Cobra, Dr. Doolittle. Whoa. The Eddie Murphy one. Well, I guess that's obvious, right? Because well, the there are like old ones. Really old. No, yeah. like, but it's like really old. Um, yeah, yeah. Bad Boys, Franklin and Bash, so much, so much. Okay. John Vernon plays the mayor. Yes. He he is, got uh, like with John Vernon or an and John Vernon. He did. He is in Animal House. Okay. Also, Killer Clowns, Airplane Two, the sequel. Um, and a lot of other stuff like TV shows and voice acting. And then John Larch plays the chief uh-huh. who is also in play Misty for me. Airplane two as well. Um, the wrecking crew Dallas. Oh, so the chief is different than the guy who's ordering, ordering him around. Yes. Okay. I don't know. Th- I don't know how rankings work in in police <laughs> or the army. And then, um, the bus driver is played by Ruth Cobart, who is also in How to Succeed in Business Without Really Trying, Sister Act 1 and 2, mm. um, Murphy Brown, and several other things. Okay. Is that everybody? The heavy hitters. Okay. Let's dive in. Okay. So the movie begins, and we see... Uh, it's like a memory of San Francisco police. Remember that? Yeah. Which that was kind of odd because the movie's basically saying like the police are ineffective. <laughs> <laughs> but, I'm assuming that was like real people. Yeah, I guess. I don't know why, why they would why like make a whole set, but like this, this movie is not like, yeah, it's saying, it's saying if you join the police, you shouldn't follow the rules. So <laughs> I don't know. Kind of weird. Um, but he, he then is, he is the police, though. He is. He's justice. He's vengeance. He is Batman. I want to read you something I found, though. Okay. Um, I so as listeners, as eagle eared listeners will know, I got a thousand and one movies to watch before you die. And this movie is on it. This is one of the movies. And I read they have a little description for each movie. And, and there was something about the movie. And I noticed it even before reading it, folks, that that like. Certain movies just absolutely capture a location and use the location to the benefit of the movie in a way that, you know, there's that thing people always say, and and now it's like ad nauseum, so people kind of joke about it, like, oh, the second, or the third character in that movie is actually New York. Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. when a movie's photographed in a certain way, Mm -hmm. you do feel like New York looms large or whatever, and this movie really captures San Francisco. That's true. Yeah, they they show a lot of Spanish architecture and yeah. like the churches and stuff. And and I think before we even get into what this little paragraph I'm going to read, what Is what's it Spanish? San Francisco? Yeah. I think so. Okay, I just yeah. don't I want to make sure St. Francisco. Um I think it's okay. like a Okay. I believe so. I wouldn't bet money well, on I it. Well, I think like all a lot of a lot of as we know. A lot of coastal towns was, are, are Spanish. What? A lot of uh, coastal towns are have Spanish influence. Yeah, you know, yeah, San yeah, Diego. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry, not to cut no, you no, off. No, no, you're okay. Yeah. I think that's a pretty fair assumption. Um, but yeah, so what I think is really amazing about this movie is not only like the seedy underbelly does it capture, but just the scope 
of the of the shots in San Francisco, to me, they kind of give off this feeling like you don't know where a killer could be in this huge area. He could be anywhere. I mean, the first kill itself is like, how did that even ha- like that? That seemed impossible. Exactly. And and then and then it also gives another feeling like we were talking about earlier with the the seventies and the serial killer feeling where where it feels like the killer could be anywhere and also it doesn't matter where you're at in the city you are not safe and it doesn't matter who you are doesn't matter who you are because like yeah. he's using a scope at the beginning of the movie to get this girl who's like with the coolest music playing <laughs> yeah just buildings and buildings away and the way it is shot is just like th- this girl is alone. But the way it's shot, it's like she's, you know, this could be anybody and he could come from anywhere and get you. Yeah. So I think that that is one of the things that elevates this movie from just like schlocky yep. to to quite yeah, interesting. It, it makes me wonder if the other movies continue to do that or not. I know. Because there's five of them. It's like that's unlikely. Yeah. Um, I imagine there's going to be a pretty steep drop in yeah. the next one, you know? Yeah. Um, But... but- Oh, go ahead. But but are killer? Are you done? Re- are you still reading? Stuff? I haven't read anything yet. Oh, okay, that was fine. all my thoughts and opinions. Oh. Well, thank you for gracing us with that. But this is what it says in the book: um, brilliantly exploiting San Francisco locations. Director Don Siegel gets a high-low motif going in the first shots, zooming back to reveal a woman swimming in a blue sky pool on a high-rise roof, while a sniper draws a bead on her from the top of another tall building. From then on, the film soars and plunges in roller coaster contours to delineate a multi leveled metropolis where a precarious sky city of helicopters, hilltops, rooftops, glass towers, and enveloping fog perches over a primitive underworld of burrows, tunnels, alleys, and quarries. No mere dro- dra- backdrop to the action, this formidable labyrinth molds and tests the characters as they twist and fight their way through it. This is vividly depicted in the tour de force se- sequence in which Scorpio runs Harry ragged from one end of town to the other as part of an evasive scheme to receive a bundle of ransom money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just think that it's worth pointing out and noting that they're really using the location well. Not yes. every movie does that. Most movies are not shot on location anymore. <laughs> so, well, yeah, that's true. That's why they have to give all those title cards because you can't tell what city it's in. No, usually they just do too many title cards. Yeah. Um, so our killer is on the roof of a skyscraper yeah. looking down on another, like we said, of a woman swimming alone in a pool on top of a building. Wow, what a life. And <laughs> um, she he, he shoots her. I thought this detail was crazy. So shoots her, kills her. Yeah. No, like, then basically, next thing we know, police are there investigating. Yeah. And and so they're they got their forensic team all over the place. We have we Dirty Harry comes in. I mean the the way he comes in is so like what what a I mean for Clint Eastwood it's like what an icon like the camera really is like we're looking up at him. Yeah, and it says Clint Eastwood as he yeah. walks onto the it looks great. rooftop. Um and so yeah, he he gets on scene is and is looking around and people are down by the body inspecting the body and there is blood. So she was shot in the shoulder, mm-hmm. but there were blood. You could see a little bit of blood like down by her hip. Okay, and that I I think it was Harry thought this, but like the pam the camera's kind of panning. We I think the camera come like it cuts to their they're behind them and with the skyscraper that the shooter killed her from yeah is what we're looking at uh-huh. with the other stuff in the foreground and i think he he like not maybe not just him but like they look up and they know like because of how the bullet traveled through her body oh yeah he shot her from another skyscraper yeah he didn't this per- a person did not come up onto this building and shoot this woman point blank and leave right he was up somewhere else because of the trajectory of the bullet. I thought that was a great detail. I didn't even catch it. Yeah. The, the, how the bullet traveled. I was too busy thinking about the locations. And <laughs> I was thinking about the location of the bullet. <laughs> uh, yeah. So then he goes up to that, that tower, grabs a shell, and we're off to the races, right? Yep. Um, so yeah, he's looking around at the crime and then, um, uh, so they then get they a start... note from Scorpio. They fi- he finds the note. On top yeah. of that skyscraper with the bullet. 
Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, then we cut to the mayor is reading it. Yeah. And he, Scorpio's kind of, like, introducing himself. This is who I am. Yeah. This is what I want. He wants $100,000. I think it starts at 100000 I think you're right, yeah. Um, I wrote one million, but then later in the movie he wrote he did two hundred, and I was like, okay, he must have done one hundred. <laughs> <laughs> so he wants a hundred thousand dollars, and if he doesn't get it in time, um, he's gonna kill a priest or a black person. Yeah. Um, and then this is another thing that I was surprised that a movie nineteen seventy one nineteen seventy one didn't do. The note says the n word. Yeah. And the mayor like looks at like gets to that part of the letter. It is like repulsed yeah. by the word and like doesn't say it. Yeah. Just surprised. I was very surprised that that happened. Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah. And, and this letter, I mean, all of the letters in this movie are very like the actual Zodiac killer letters. I mean, mm-hmm. I think that he even threatened this. I, I can't remember for sure, but I think he said Probably something sure. about a priest at one point. And I think he did say something like very terrible about black people and wanting to kill some or yeah. something like that. Um, so, so all of these were, were it's a, it's a very strange movie because it's it's like a fictionalized in in a way. This movie is almost like it's it's almost like a like like the ending of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, where it's like, what if yeah. we could have stopped this? Yeah. Instead of having the Manson murders happen. Yeah. Um, and yeah. he, um, I'm trying, oh yeah, and I think he says, like, re- reply to his letter through the San Francisco Chronicle, like in a certain section, like right. the personal ads or something, I can't remember. Um, which I think is also something that he said. Well, I think in the, uh, was it, was it, didn't he send the letters to the San Francisco Chronicle? The Oh, the duh. Killer, yeah, he did. The real killer? Yeah. Um, but yeah. also, was there no communicating with him via that way at all? I just don't remember. I don't remember. Okay. Well, um, we'll we'll remember when we rewatch. I just think that's Zodiac. also just like an interesting detail because later in the movie, when he is on another rooftop going yeah. to kill his next person, he looks at the paper like in the personal ads and has circled his reply, like the mayor's reply to him or the police. Department. Yeah. And it's like, please give us some time. Yeah. Oh, I think there is that in in the real okay killing because remember there's like the family that like the, oh yeah he asked for his letters to be published oh, okay and he's like if you don't publish oh, them in the paper yeah yes and then because that's how that old couple like discovered the first clue they well they pub I don't know if they published his letters but they pu- publish his code yeah 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 oh <laughs> we can just keep saying yeah about it. it well it's just crazy I that that. That story is so scary. And you know, a year or two ago, a thing came out that some people think that they know who did it. They cracked the code. It wasn't just the code. They just think they know that they know, like they know who the person is. Yeah. Yeah. So they. I know the code was a big breakthrough, but I think there was something else after that. Well, yeah. So I think like two or three years ago, I think it was like when the pandemic first hit, someone cracked one of the letters. Yeah. And then I want to say last year. Someone right. cracked like the final letter and and I think that it's still like gibberish on what the name is because he says like my name is and then there's uh you know the code and they were able to basically crack it and and narrow it down to I think two people. Yeah, the article that I read kind of really posits this one person yeah. based on um like I think there was a person. Was that, wasn't who, it was like a retired police chief or something? Oh, I don't know about that. But th- it was a person who I, I feel like there was someone who maybe witnessed the murder or survived the murder and described the man, mm-hmm. and he had scratches on his face. And there's like a pic- a picture of this man, yeah, who had scratches on his face or certain scars on his face, who I think was already kind of like. That that sounds like it's so simple. Like, why didn't we catch this guy a long time ago? But yeah, that's like my foggy memory of it. So, on I just went to Wikipedia, and and uh, in 2018, the Vallejo Police Department announced their intention to attempt to collect the Zodiac Killer's DNA from the back of stamps he used during his correspondence. The analysis by a private laboratory was expected to check the DNA against GED match. It was hoped that the Zodiac Killer may be caught in a similar fashion. Yada yada yada. Um. 
Oh, they as of 2022, they haven't resolved that. Well, that's not that's not what we're talking about though, because I thought they I thought there was something about. Okay, hang on, Zodiac Killer. Found. Maybe we should just get back to the movie. Really? Because I'm sure people who are listening to this already know. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, and another, and this is par- partially because I don't trust this, but it, it premiered on Fox News. Was a cold case team says Zodiac Killer ID linking him to another murder. Yeah, killer as Gary Francis Post, who passed away in 2018. Hmm. Although, if you're not the Zodiac Killer, sorry for calling you out, but Fox News already did it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're gonna get into all of that and more this month on Patreon when we cover. David Fincher's Zodiac. Oh, we are doing that? I can't remember we said that we were doing that. We're saying it now. Patreon.com slash Micah Macabre. We're going to get in. Let's. We'll get into it. We'll go okay. through all of it, and we'll go through Zodiac, the movie, and you have to sign up for $3 um, to listen to that. Okay. So link in the show notes. But yeah, so the mayor is saying, like, we got to figure this out. Dirty Harry, you can be the bag man. Um, but I don't want any of this business like what happened down at Fillmore is what he says. And and then this is when yeah, we get the was, hint of yeah. who this character is, and like he, he I, I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, he says I shot a man with intent to rape, and a then, man who was attempting to rape. Yeah, you made it sound like Clint Eastwood's character was. Oh yeah, so Clint Eastwood says I shot a man with intent to rape, and then the mayor says, "How did you establish intent?" This also sounds, so sounds weird how you said it, but yeah. I'm quoting what the movie says. I know, said. I know, I know. Okay. And then the mayor says, how did you establish an intent? And he says, when a naked man is chasing a woman with a butcher knife and a heart on, I don't imagine he's collecting for the Red Cross. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you you know what's so funny? I feel like whenever I have like a little planned, like, okay, I'll quote this thing I'm for the movie. I'm going to tear it down. You, you just like cut it off and don't let it go. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's marriage. <laughs> But um, yeah. So we see that he he's willing to go the distance if he needs to. Yeah, and and maybe kind of establishing at least to the mayor and the police chief and stuff that he he takes law into his own hands at a certain point yeah. and in instances and maybe you know yeah innocent until proven guilty. But what I was seeing was probable cause enough yeah. to do what I did. Which that one feels a lot more That's, justified. That was pretty straightforward. Yeah, I will give him that one. I thought it was interesting too when the mayor was asking him, like, "Tell me everything you know about this case," and the lieutenant kept cutting him off. Yeah, and Dirty Harry just keeps on like rolling his eyes. Basically, yeah. it's like the lieutenant's like, "Let's continue to be diplomatic because this is a yeah, this is the mayor we're talking to." Yeah, um, but you know, and it's good to remember that we have the memorial to the San Francisco police at the beginning of the movie <laughs> to backdrop this. So then Dirty Harry leaves and is on the studio lot of Warner Brothers. Yeah, we've been here before. We yeah. took a tour. It's a San Francisco of, street, but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a set. And we, we I remember we went through and they were like, hey, have you guys seen Dirty Harry? Because that, that's where they shot this the bank robbery scene. And I was like, whoa, that's crazy. That's the scene. Um, and you, when we watched it the other night, you were like, I don't remember this at all. Makes sense because you hadn't really watched this movie. Yeah. So, um, but he goes to a burger joint slash hot dog joint and gets yeah. a hot dog. And boy, did it make me want a hot dog! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked good. And he just says to the guy, He's like, Hey, is this car that's parked in front of the bank, is it still running? And he goes, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then, and then he says, Okay, call the police, tell them to bring backup. And then, right after that, like the bank alarm starts going off, mm-hmm. and he walks outside. He shoots in the crowded people. He, he could does. have definitely killed he some people. Does. This is a fictional movie, though. Um, and then he shoots this guy. And he shoots uh, a couple people. Yeah, shoots another guy. And he's just eating his hot dog the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes up to the guy, does the famous speech where he's like, I know what you're thinking. You're ask, trying to ask yourself if he shot five or six shots. I'm not doing verbatim here, folks. I just I, love the the part where he says, I got to admit, I got a little caught up in the excitement, and I don't know either. I lost track myself. Yeah. yeah. And then and then he's like, so you got to ask yourself, do you feel lucky? And then the guy goes, 
uh, he, he, he's like lucky about what? And he's right. Doesn't he say something like that? He says something, but Harry is starting to walk away. And the, and the man's like, I gotta know. I gotta know. And so Harry does shoot him. Yeah. But it's, but it's yeah, empty. It's empty, which on that, I mean, I like to, I, I imagine that he totally knows how oh, many yeah, shots yeah, he yeah. has left. Cause he's not just going to kill this random guy, yeah. but, um, yeah. So then, they do that and that is that is like what he's remembered as you know you're gonna think of like the zodiac stuff second for the first thing you're gonna yes. think of is do you feel lucky punk yeah. so um i mean he gets to repeat that whole thing at the end of the movie too right yeah they knew what they had with that yeah um i know we've talked about this before but when was the last time something was like quotable like that in modern day hmm that's that's hard to that's hard to think about. Yeah, I just kind of it kind of feels like that, like the like the doing that just is has kind of died a little bit. It feels like hmm. I think there's just so much stuff for us to watch that it's not like oh I'll just go see Dirty Harry again. It's like no I got to watch the new season of this show that just came out. Yeah, or I got it. Or or it lasts on Twitter for like one day and then the next day everyone's like okay a trailer for this other movie dropped so we're making fun of that now. Yeah. Um, it just feels like it feels like there's not like quotable lines anymore. Yeah, the first thing you'd have to think about is a superhero movie. Yeah. Or something like it. I will say often when I'm when I'm out like walking the dog or something and I like pass someone, I'll think like on your left. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that's, that's also a thing people say. I know, but it, I I think of Falcon doing that okay. with Captain America and Captain America doing it to him. That's okay. what I think. Um, or you think? Uh, I mean, yeah, we, I don't know. I mean, we have quoted a lot from Guardians too when Yondu is is like flying up in the big climatic yeah, moment yeah, movie, yeah. and he said, "I'm Mary Poppins, y'all." <laughs> <laughs> but I I wonder like like if I go anywhere. I could say, do you feel lucky? Yeah, yeah, And yeah. everyone will know what I'm doing. But if I go, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all, like maybe like 10 people in the room will know that. This is a room of 20 people. Well, that's half. That's half. That's so, a lot. Um, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe it's, maybe it just, maybe it's because, you know what it probably is, is we, well, now we're parents as of this, when this episode comes out, but we're not parents yet. And our kids will probably hear us quoting stuff. That's and, true. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, everybody knows I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. I mean, and it'll, be, it'll be The Office. Yeah. It has the like, Office is quoted all the time. Yeah. And that's not just because of your sister who has a problem. Yeah. And your brother-in-law who has a problem, <laughs> who's also my brother-in-law. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, they start... The police force, like, they decide to patrol the rooftops, mm -hmm. and they're worried about this guy who's going to, you know, kill somebody. Um, and then around this time is when they start discussing why they call him Dirty Harry, because he gets a new partner. Mm -hmm. And he's, of course, he's upset about the new Chico. partner. Yeah, <laughs> but I'm but I'm glad that he like pretty immediately is like as long as you keep up I don't care and the that guy's great the partner's great like, yeah he I don't know he he doesn't get in the way no um so cause I just feel like sometimes that that dynamics a cliche but we we learn because of him having a new partner his other partners died on the job yeah and then his other partner after that is currently in the hospital yeah and then throughout the movie we find out um. The one partner that, well, okay, pretty soon after that, actually, I know I'm skipping a little bit, yeah. but Dirty Harry saves a suicidal man on the top of a rooftop, mm -hmm. gets him down, and he, when, when he's up there on the crane, the, the guy wants to, like, come out with him. Right. And, and he said, no, my last partner, my partner did that, and the guy, like, they both fell off. And the, their their bodies were so <laughs> yeah. mangled and smashed on the pavement, you couldn't tell whose arms were theirs, whose legs were theirs. Yeah, yeah. So gross. Um, and then his other partner got shot on the job, and I think it was because of something Harry did, like yeah. a decision he made. So it's like, if you're Harry's partner, you got not it. looking good. Yeah, yeah, you don't want to be his partner. Um, but speaking of that suicide scene, uh, 
I believe I, I read that Clint Eastwood directed that scene. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Cool. So, um, had he not directed anything yet? Well, earlier this year, his first movie, Play Misty for Me, came out. Oh, that's his movie. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just assuming that came out in maybe the summer. Okay. Good movie. I've never um, seen it. Is that a like western? It? No, no. Uh, I've it. It is. It stars. Um, I'm forgetting her name. Uh, but Lucille from yeah, Arrested Development, the mother. What is her name? I'll look it up. Uh, she she becomes obsessed with uh, Clint oh, yeah, Eastwood, and see, she's like stalking him. And so it sounds so yeah. good. It's it's Jessica very Walter. yeah Jessica Walter. Um, it's yeah it's really good. My dad owns it. My pops, who's definitely listening to this episode. <laughs> Um, so him and Chico are out on the town patrolling. Mm-hmm. It's night. Well, before that. Oh, you're right. Sorry. We see yeah. Scorpio at a church and he's like, gonna, he's looking at people. He's trying to pick his victim. And then he finds this black man and he, I mean, it, it seems very clear that the black man is gay. Yeah. And, and there's a reaction like where he's like, he's even more like, oh, I got to kill this yeah. guy. He, to him, he's like two strikes. Yeah, because he's a bad dude. So he's he's like watching him. And I also, I mean, I thought it was interesting the inclusion of the gay element in yeah, 1971. Yeah, I thought that was interesting too. Uh, I mean, we're in San Francisco, so that makes sense too. Yeah. But, um. So we're he's he's gonna get him, and at one point he like loses him, and then he's gonna get him again. But then a helicopter comes down, spots him. Yeah, and he takes off. Yep. And then we have the night. Yeah, so they, now they know to look for a man with a tan briefcase. Yeah. That they assume will that is something is stores his gun. So they're out of the night patrolling. They think they see a man with a tan brief, briefcase, follows him home. Um, and then Dirty Harry is looking through a window. He, he's being a peeping Tom, looking through yeah. a window. <laughs> this is so funny to me. So it's this man who does have a tan briefcase, but he just has a bunch of clothes he, like, bought for his girlfriend or something yeah and she immediately strips and i gotta say this was so refreshing on so many levels oh and by the way before this movie started i said we're watching a movie from the 70s there's definitely gonna be some random useless nudity so this woman takes her shirt off and she is now nude from the waist up Mm -hmm. um so it it is like you said i was like well i'm kind of surprised we got this far into the movie and we're just now seeing the boobs yeah um but she is a, a, an overweight person. Mm-hmm. That already very refreshing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and then um, Clay or Her- Dirty Harry is like on a trash can propped up, and he like fall or he gets caught by somebody calling him a peeping tom. Starts beating him up. All these other men start showing up, and they're like, "What are you doing, peeping tom? Like being peeping on hot Mary?" <laughs> <laughs> So it was like, okay, that's refreshing too. <laughs> it was so weird. Yeah, they think she's a hottie, probably because they've peeped themselves. They were yeah. probably on their way over there to peep. So they all start beating him up. His partner Chico shows up and is like, "I'm the police. You got to stop." Yeah. They stop beating him up, and then he's like, "What? Well, we got to arrest them now." They assaulted a police officer, and Dirty Harry's like, "No." Yeah. No, I I was peeping. Yeah. And and so that there's like another like shade to it. I think that they show right where it's like, it is like he does like it's fine. What like, do you, like like keep not going to with not it? to not like enforce the law on oh, these people yeah. who who were like. Well, they were kind of justified in what they were doing. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. Yeah. yeah. Um. But yeah, and 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 this is uh, around here too. Is when we. So earlier we we heard like they call him Dirty Harry because he hates everybody. Doesn't do, and and they and they just name off like all ethnicities and are like he hates them all. Oh, I don't remember that. Yeah, and then this time they're like, man, they really call you Dirty Harry, and he's like, I get all the dirty jobs. Yeah. So it's kind of like this collection term. Yeah, he he gets stuck with it, and so um, then we have the suicide attempt, mm-hmm. which we talked about. And then we have. Well, what did you think about that scene? Like, like, what you, about the inclusion of it? Because, uh, well, it made me think of immediately. Uh, there's a, there's like, I, I, I guess they're probably riffing on this. Uh, Lethal Weapon One has a suicide scene as well. Oh, okay. Where uh, Mel Gibson goes up to get the jumper, and then 
he handcuffs him to him. And they're handcuffed together. And then the guy's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then the guy's like, well, now we got to jump because they have like the big balloon thing out. And the guy's like, I don't want to do that. And then he just jumps off the building with him. And it's pretty cool. I don't remember that. Um, Leave the weapons fun. I like that movie. And number two rocks too. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I mean, I think it just shows that Dirty Harry's a bad boy. Yeah. But he gets the job done. He gets the job done. He's a bad, he's dirty, but he's also hairy, I think yeah. is what that shows. Okay. We, we saw the, well, we saw a little bit of dirty, but we also saw the hairy in that scene. Yeah. What I mean, what do you think about the inclusion of this well, yeah, scene? I, I feel like there were a, a couple instances of them showing crime in San Francisco. Uh-huh. I don't think that they were trying to make San Francisco look like a cesspool, like how some movies in the 70s are about new york yeah because new york was a very unsafe place during, like like taxi driver yeah during that time so i i did i like that they included some of these like they're they're yeah they're looking for this person who's killing people but they're also still just doing their job yeah i liked that stuff yeah yeah because it gets us a sense of the characters yeah so is it the the next day <laughs> that they find the 10 year old boy yeah so there's a a ten year old black boy who was killed. Yeah, by the shot guy. in the face. They say. Yeah. And so they go there, and now now it's like, okay, this is getting pretty serious. Yeah. I mean, I mean, the the woman is bad, but like a little boy, that's that's crazy. Like now yeah. it's getting bad, bad, bad. And so then they get their list of demands, uh, which is, hey, you have fourteen hours uh, to give me two hundred thousand dollars. Uh, because I have a 14-year-old girl who is buried, and she only has enough oxygen for 14 hours. And now Harry has to be the bag man. Again, no tricks this time. I mean, there weren't really tricks the first time. I think they actually didn't get the money to him the first time. No, because was... at some point the lieutenant or the chief is telling... Because I think Dirty Harry's kind of like, we're just going to give it to him. And I think some some superiors, like, the mayor is pulling a lot of strings yeah. to make this happen. Yeah. It's it's at this point where it's like he's he's got someone held hostage. We don't have a choice. Right. Um and then finally it's it's so funny for you listeners. Gilmore, when we are working in this room, hey Gil, come here. Come here. He's eating something. When, Probably something under my desk that I dropped. Yeah. So so when we're when we're working, he just usually chills out in the room or in another room. He doesn't really explore. But when we record, he goes, oh, now I'm going to sniff all the outskirts of the room and move around and, and like, and run into cords. Feet. and Yeah. But, but when we're working, he's like, no, they're working. He doesn't take the podcast seriously. <laughs> but people love Gilmore. Don't, don't they, Gil? Yes, they do. So now Dirty Harry is transferring the money. And we have, like, I, I think that this is the plot of Die Hard 3. The whole movie, if I remember correctly. Oh, where I've not seen it. Yeah, it's like you need to bring this guy money or do something, and Bruce Willis has to like run around the city while Samuel L. Jackson is the the bad guy, and he's on the phone, and he's like, "Now you have to do this. Now you is have to good? do that." I, I think from what I remember, I mean, when I was a kid, I liked all of them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how they all hold up. But I feel like three is one where people are usually like, three is actually pretty sweet. Wow. Three is good. Yeah, that sounds like a Keanu movie. Yeah, yeah, it's very speed. I think it is kind of in that speed zone. Yeah. Like it, it, that type of it's movie. It's in the speed zone. It's in the speed zone. <laughs> um, it's in the speed limit, really. Hmm. <laughs> so now Harry is being running around town with the bag of money, and he's getting phone calls from phone booths. Yeah. Which is always tension building. Yes. Um, it's it's a great sequence. At one point he's going through a tunnel and he he gets mugged, but he's able to like oh, gosh, pull out his forty four. So crazy. Yeah, and tell those guys like get out of here. Yeah. But he's he's trying to trying to run and then his partner has a listening device, but it's back in the seventies. Mm-hmm. So it's a microphone, it's only has a very small range. Range. But he's following Harry. Yeah. Um, then he finally makes it to a phone booth, but someone else answers it. Yeah. Before he gets there. And it's like, oh, it's over. But then he gets like, there's a call again. The yeah. caller calls back. 
And he, the caller tells him to go to, I can't remember what park it is. It's probably the famous one, the big one in San Francisco, but tells him to go. Hyde Park? Is that what it's called? I'm so bad at that stuff. So Yeah. It's not Lincoln Park. That's in Chicago. Yeah. Um, But I I was astounded when I found out that was a real place. I think I was too. (laughs) And I think I found it. I feel like I found it out from listening to the Adnan Syed podcast. Oh, really? Because I think there was something with Lincoln Park in that crime i don't know i I, don't think so i think at the beginning they mentioned it for some reason okay yeah i don't know though i could be wrong what was that podcast called serial serial yes yes we all look back and think we could have that time back couldn't we you know he's been released i did uh, yeah interesting it is very interesting yeah um so he goes to the park uh-huh. Where there are people making out, people making love, and there's people making love. <laughs> no, I'm just assuming. Oh. <laughs> it's the '70s, free love. I can I tell you a story about San Francisco and people making love? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we were on a seance tour, and we were going through. Um, I can't remember which park it is. It's not that park. Though. Okay. Um, a Golden Gate Park. That's the park we were going through, and we were like. It took a while to park because we had the big RV. <laughs> and so we finally park and we're and it was this weird, like almost like magical thing we stumbled upon. But I'll get to that later. With the love making? No, that's <laughs> in between. Um so we get out, us four guys, and then Dave, Sean's dad, and we we're walking down into the park. I think we had like Frisbee with us or something, like Frisbee golf, and we were like, Oh, I think there's a park here, we can play Frisbee golf. Waste a day away, it'll be fun. And we're cutting through the park, and we we walked like by these two young people, like probably in their early twenties, having sex, and uh, they were like, "Oh, sorry," and they just kind of stopped while we were like, and walked by, kind of, kind of like waved. Nineteen and were, year old like, Micah. Yeah, they were they were keeping it modest though. Oh, okay. What they weren't <laughs> both naked or something? No, they were not both naked. But they were they were having sex. They that's were connected, but very, not naked. They were connected. That's so <laughs> wild. Yeah, it was wild. And in my memory, in my mind's eye, like the, the way the path was, we had to walk like by them. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like right next to them. Like they did not go very far off the beaten path. Well, it was like they were out of the park, but but since we had parked in a weird spot, we were just cutting oh. into the park. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we were like going through like a wooded area. Yeah. And they were there. But what was weird is, I mean, we're talking, it was like, you know, 2 p.m. probably. Uh-huh. Like it was, it was not cover of night or anything uh-huh. like that. Um, and then we were wandering around the park and we're hearing like loud music. We're like, what the heck? And we go around this corner and we just see like fenced off area and like a, like a legit stage. And we're hearing loud, like professional sounding music. And we walk in, it's free entry and it is a Chipotle sponsored concert in Golden Gate Park. And they gave you like tickets so you could get free Chipotle. Um, wow. I, th- I think there, and then if you went to their booths that like told you about their food, you'd get like a free ticket that you could use like after that day. Yeah. So we got to eat for free. And then we also got like a meal for free afterward. And on top of that, they had like a band. I mean, I, I, Sean Muir, please don't get mad at me, but a band that I'm not crazy about, Walk the Moon. Before they got like really famous, that was who was playing. That was one of the bands that was playing, and we watched their set. Um, that I mean, they were still they were famous, but they weren't like radio Where famous yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was kind of it was just like it was such a that weird is so day. Cool. And then you saw Nick Kroll riding his bike. I think it was the same day. Yeah. Yeah. I saw Nick Kroll riding his. Is that bike. the same day you guys almost got arrested? I think that was a different time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we don't. Wh- hey, this is a San Francisco series. Maybe on a future episode, I will tell you about the time that Grayson and I, no, Sean and I, got arrested on Golden Gate Bridge Park, or uh, no, on the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, but in this movie, <laughs> that's such a funny thing that happened. <laughs> that's so funny. That's pretty cool about the, the Chipotle thing. Yeah. Um, as during well, uh, detained is a better word. We were detained. Yeah. Yeah. Which it also sounds kind of scarier. It's a pretty wild story. Yeah. So, um, Dirty Harry, I like that I keep calling him Dirty Harry. Yeah. Um, he is walking through the park and he is approached by a random man. Who, I like this. Yeah. S- who says, like, people call me Alice. 
And then I think, well, does he ask him like why, or does he like ask him a question? Yeah, and he he gives an answer that's like not connected to the question he was asked. Yeah, like this this person is out of their mind. Yeah. Um, and he's just like, get out of my way. So he, yeah, yeah. He, he there's just a lot of random people in this park. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's he, a location thing. Like, I like know. it just feels like a lived in world. You yeah. Know? And he was told to go specifically to a cross, a, like a giant cross in this park. Yeah. Gets there. And is ordered by the killer, you know, turn around, drop the bag, drop yeah. your gun. Um, d- he complies. And then the killer comes up to him and starts beating him up. Yeah. And Chico is off in the bushes. And he's like laughing maniacally and oh, stuff it's, like that. It's weird. Yeah. And Chico's like off in the distance and start. well, he starts shooting at him. Yeah. Um, which also alerts the killer. Like you're not alone. You were supposed to be yeah. alone. This, pr- this girl's going to die. Yeah. And, Dirty Harry is trying, you know, like, don't shoot him. Don't do anything. Like, because his mentality is we need to save the girl. Just yeah. tell, like, you can just beat me up as much as you want. Just tell me where she is. But before they had even done this, he did say, you know, the girl's already dead, right? When he was in the, in a, in the mayor's office. Yeah, but then I think he just had a chance. Like, he's like. Well, no, he's got chance, a job to do. The chance of her even being alive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's making the right move, but, but yeah. he is right. It's like, he knows the old expression you give him, uh, you give a rat, you give him a uh, uh, a mouse a, a cookie. It's gonna want milk. Oh, like that children's book that was so cute. Yeah, you've heard that expression though, right? No. What? No. Well, it's used in the the movie Air Force One because they're trying to figure out, you know, how they should negotiate with these terrorists, and they're like, well, we should give into the demands, and then I think Glenn Close, or maybe it's Harrison Ford, I can't remember which one is. Is like, she the first lady? I can't remember, but he's no. the president. I know that. And uh, no, no, because I think he stowed away and then he winds up killing everybody. Um, and Gary Oldman is the bad guy in that, which I didn't know when I was Harrison a kid. Ford's not the president? No, Harrison Ford's the, yeah, but he like hides. Oh, okay. And then he goes and kills everybody a la Die Hard. Would love to rewatch that movie and see if it's any good. Hmm. Um, but then I think I think Glenn Close, <laughs> Gilmore, is like, she, she, she says, yeah, if you give a, a, a mouse a cookie, it's going to want milk. And that's when I knew this is an expression I love. Yes. And so I used it. Are you filming? Ow! I think she was. See, he he gets those feet, and he's got great little chompers, and they really bite hard. So, uh, yeah, where are we at? Where are we at? You're you're on your phone. Well, I was <laughs> sorry. Um, so. Harry had a knife in his sock that he pulls out and stabs the killer in the leg. Uh huh. And the killer, now wounded, runs away with the bag of money. Right. R- rolls down a hill with the knife still in his leg, and that hurt to watch. Yeah. Uh, and then he leaves the money behind. Yes, that's right. And hobbles to a ho- to a hospital nearby. Right. Yeah. Where he is treated at, at, during that time. Well, like well, they like, find out the girl died. They don't know that yet. The killer got away, though. Yeah. That's to what they think. And we... Oh, uh, you're right. That's after. Harry is being treated. Um, He's back at the police station. But then they get a call. Oh, they get a call that, like, there was a... Someone reported that a man fitting that description with that wound showed up at this hospital. Yeah. And his partner got shot in the... At the cross. Oh, right? that was in this scene? Yeah, because his partner doesn't go with him to this next scene. That's true. He takes another guy. Yeah. So partner gets shot, doesn't die. But um, yeah. Harry, wounded, but driven by justice, uh-huh. uh, goes to the hospital with another dude, another detective, questions the doctor. The doctor recognized the man. Yeah. How did he recognize him? And so tries to get him to remember. Did he say that the, he thinks that that man, that man was handing out flyers at the stadium? Or worked yeah. at the stadium. And then he's like, I, I think he said handing out flyers at the stadium, like helping out or something. And then he's like, and I think they let him stay there. Oh, was that what he said? Yeah, at this like shack. Oh, okay. And so, okay, quick pause. One thing I'm realizing that I like about this movie a lot, um, I'm thinking about the partner. So he gets kind of unceremoniously shot. And then he's off screen for a while. And then they come back and he's like, hey, I can't do this anymore. I have a degree in sociology. I can go teach. Or or he says something like that. And Dirty Harry's like, okay, sounds good. Yeah. 
And and what I kind of like, and it feels like such a 70s and 60s thing, um, I love a well-written, well-oiled, you know, back-to-the-future type script where it's like, boom, A to B to C to D. You know, I love that. Um, but but I feel like less and less now you you have movies where, like, that just feels so realistic that that would happen to this character and and yet it is not played as super dramatic and it didn't feel like oh we have to set up how he thinks about something because of this in scene one so that by scene yeah, three yeah, when yeah. He, it's just like yeah i can't do this anymore well i think we get a little bit of an explanation after too because he leaves the hospital with chico's wife yeah and as they're really cool how they did that shot too down the stairwell yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. but the wife is just kind of going on and on about how unsafe this is um, she like, you know, doesn't know if her husband's going to die any, every day he leaves her work, stuff like that. Um, and all of, all of the stuff she's complaining about is very valid uh-huh. and he's just listening and, and she's like, well, what does your wife think? And yeah. he's like, my wife's dead. Yeah. And, and it's like throughout the movie, people have like said things about his wife, but in like in a way that's like, oh, I'm sorry for bringing her up and we yeah. don't know what happens. So we finally find out that she's dead and the, you know, the woman feels so bad for but kind of everything she said saying yeah. that about his wife and he's like no it's okay she died in a car accident there's really no reason for why it happened she yeah. did yeah and it's, so it's just everything's just like it that's life he wants to quit to go on a teaching yeah. that's his choice it's his life yeah and 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 i i think that's a charm about this movie in a weird way because like i think if this movie was written now you know you you'd say the wife thing and then the end of the movie there'd be like a moment where, you know, the Zodiac killer is about to kill a woman who he kind of reminds him of his wife or something like that. And then he's like, no, I have to make the hard decision because I wasn't able to save my wife, but I can save you. Yeah. And that works a lot of times. And yeah. I like that when that happens in movies, yeah. but it's kind of nice that it's like, nope, I just don't like this guy and I want yeah. him to die. You know what this made me re- reminded me of probably because it was a car accident Yeah, uh, was signs. I, that just popped in my head when you were saying that. No way. That. Yeah. Uh, the, especially the, just the whole, oh my gosh, that would be so freaking good. Yeah. But the whole dynamic that, for one, Mel Gibson's wife is pinned against a tree and is dying. Uh-huh. And their last conversation is just like a sob fest. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. And then later in this movie, through in time, he has to choose a man who has basically lost faith has to choose to save the man who's responsible for killing his wife. Yeah. M. Night, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and see, that's a that's a good example of like the opposite. Yeah. Um, and I'm not faulting it. I no, love yeah. science, and yeah. again, I'm saying I love both types of movies. Yeah. But like in science, it's like, oh, it could it can't just be that his wife died in a car accident and it's emotional. It's like, oh no, she also says something. That that is like a premonition of the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That he can then say to Joaquin Phoenix, who can then defeat the aliens. Swing hard or something. Uh, see, see, see him swing or uh, see uh, what's his name? Who Joaquin's character? Yeah, it's see something swing. Yeah, see something swing is what she says. I don't remember what the something is. Yeah, and it it's also like a reference to like a baseball game he played. Well, he was a really good baseball player. Yeah. So so it's it kind of like time to watch that movie again. Yeah. It's kind of like the idea I think in like the internal logic is that she's just imagining like a nice moment. But it's so emotional and happened at such a high stress point that Mel Gibson is reminded of that and then he's like, "Oh my gosh, hit him with the baseball bat." Mm-hmm. You know. Bada bing. Bada bing. Oh. <laughs> um yeah, so then they're at the field. The stadium, yeah. The stadium. And uh, there's a field inside. And they break and enter. They break well, and enter. They don't break, but they enter um, without a warrant. <laughs> yeah. And, and the guy's like, we don't have a warrant. And he's like, I don't care. And they break in and they go and they find him like pretty immediately. Um, and and I, I like this touch. They break into his like little house, his shack. And without saying anything, again, unceremonious. That's what that's one of the things I'm really liking about this movie. Uh, Dirty Harry touches the coffee pot and kind of like shakes his hand like it's hot, but mm-hmm. he doesn't say like coffee pot's still hot. He must have just been here. He just does that, and you go, 
oh cool mm-hmm. nice touch mm-hmm. if you if you were looking at your phone you missed it but mm-hmm. It's a I nice touch. Didn't catch that, but or I just don't remember. But yeah, great, great touch. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and then he's running across the field, and then the guy who's with him turns on the lights. He shoots him in the shoulder, leg. Shoots him in the leg. Yeah. And he's on the field, and see, I'd only seen this movie once a long time ago, and I was like, "Huh? I thought this ended on a bus." <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, "What happens in between this and the bus scene?" Because yeah. like, feels like there's a lot of movie left. But I, you know, what the heck? But I knew I'd seen it, and I Doesn't knew it ended him. on a bus. Doesn't kill him. But there is this shot that is so incredible because part of it is like that's just your money shot right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in the stadium. He's got the guy, um, like hold, held by the gun, and Dog. then it's a helicopter shot pull out, like from and we're seeing close to them. Dirty Harry putting pressure on the man's wound. Yeah. Trying to get him to tell him where the girl is as the helicopter is, yeah, zooming out. Yeah. It looks and, so cool. And here's where I I would posit something. Uh as a I, I don't think that this movie is satirical, but I think you could read it as satire. Okay. Um and and what I will say for that is in this scene, he is attacking this guy, no warrant, breaks and enter, they point that out. And then uh, while that's happening, you know, he's torturing the guy. And it's actually kind of like it hurts a little bit. And the guy's screaming like, I have rights. I want a lawyer. Yeah. I have rights. Yeah, that's what he's screaming. I have rights. And so I think you could almost read this movie as them kind of m- like making a commentary gung-ho movie about like being a macho man and not following the law. And and pointing out like y- you can't do that, but mm. uh, but the thing is, I don't think the movie is ever aware I mean, of Roger that. Roger Ebert didn't feel that way. No, I know, but I'm I'm almost thinking like maybe as a to someone who's saying like, oh, this is a fascist movie. Maybe that would be something I would say is like, well, if if you look at it in a satirical lens, which I don't think they intended, you could almost see it as like, yeah, this is what happens when when someone does stuff like that, mm. and that that's how ridiculous is that? Yeah. Um. But at the end, he's 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 always the hero in the mm-hmm. movie. That's why I don't think that that works. Yeah. yeah. But but the movie goes so far to point out how bad the things are that he's doing. Yeah. That it almost feels like they want you to be aware of it. Yeah. But but at the end of the day, I think they're like, it's pretty cool, huh? <laughs> you know. So, it is a little fascist. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah. And so then they get him back and to custody. They are able to find the girl, and she is dead. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, he didn't read him his Miranda rights, and he tortured him. Mm-hmm. And he came in without a warrant, so they have to let him go. And and this is another thing where it's like, you're kind of watching it as someone who's seen a lot of procedurals by this point, and you're kind of like, well, yeah, you have to let him go. They can't get him on anything because all of this is inadmissible, and they they explain all of that. And yeah. and that's a moment where you're like, maybe maybe if he had done his job correctly, they probably wouldn't have saved the girl, but they could have like avoided the whole bus thing, and mm-hmm. he could have stopped him, and they could have put him in jail mm-hmm. and not killed him, too. Um, You know? So it's a lot of what ifs, I guess. Yeah. I, I, it's it's interesting. It's um, yeah. tantalizing. Hmm. <laughs> um. But yeah, so the, it's kind of funny that he gets like upset about it because he also has proven throughout the movie that he is aware of the law. So it's yeah. kind of funny that he's not he's like, "Come on, you're going to let him go." And it's like, "Yeah, dude, you you know how this works." Yeah. It's it's like he he is doing his I mean, he's not doing it technically, he's not doing it within the limits of the law, but he is doing his job. Yeah. And basically it's, I mean, the whole role of like a detective or police officer is like, I'm doing my job. Okay, district attorney, here you go. Now it's your turn. Yeah, you do like, yours now. Now you do your job. And then that's, that is why that scene is so good And the, because the district attorney has said, you made my job impossible uh-huh. because of how you did your job. Yeah. And so they let him go and he goes to this guy in this random area. And well, I- Harry starts following him. Yeah. A little bit, like doing some surveillance. Yeah. Um, and again, it's like 
you're not supposed to be doing this. No, but it, it is at the same time, though, that it's like, he is their prime spe- suspect. Oh, yeah. I mean, he is the guy. Yeah. Um. So, like, they, they have to, someone has to follow him. Yeah. But, but yeah, like no, no, it's not part of his job to do it. Right. No one's told him to do it. I guess, I guess, yeah. And now by this point, he did see this guy when yeah. he went to the cross. So he does know that he is the actual killer. So I, I can see the passion of being like, now, now it's less of like prisoners with Hugh Jackman where he's like, he's like, I'm pretty sure it's this guy. Yeah. He does know, you know, for half of this movie, he does know that it's that guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> trying to adjust your mic there. Yeah. Um, and so he starts following him around. I wrote Harry following him around dirty style. <laughs> <laughs> and then, oh yeah, the the guy is like watching children play on a playground, and I hated that. Yeah, that was very so weird. much. And then, um, then like you like you were saying, he he goes to this guy like in this abandoned looking building. Yeah. Payton. I like this. Cause I did not remember. And I'm like, what is he doing? This was nuts. And he said, he gives him $200 and the guy says, how bad you want it? And he says, I want $200 worth. He sits on a chair and the man starts beating him up. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That was so crazy. So beats him up pretty dang bad. Yeah. yeah. The man is taken to the hospital. All these reporters are around him, swarmed around him. And he's like, it was Harry Callahan. He's been following me. Yeah. He did this to me. Um, and then we cut to, I think, Harry's back in, with the mayor. Uh-huh. Being questioned about this. Yeah. And it, it was inter- from my, if I could be misremembering, but, you know, the mayor's like, did you do this? Have, uh-huh. Or no, I think he says, like, have you been following him? And he's like, yeah, I have been. He yeah. killed people. Yeah. What, what do you want from me? <laughs> <laughs> and then pretty much, like, right after that, the killer like goes into a liquor store and oh, he's that like, was crazy. He's like, Hey, are, is this that liquor store that's been robbed 14 times? And, well, yeah. This guy's like, I've been robbed 14 times in the past three years. Yeah. Buddy, what are you doing here? <laughs> right. <laughs> and then, uh, he's like, Oh man, that's crazy. And then the guy pulls out a gun and he's like, see, I come prepared now though. The And then the Zodiac killer like hits him over the head with a bottle. And then he steals, what does he steal? I don't remember why he did that. He does steal a bottle of liquor. Yeah. Um, but he grabs something by the cash register, but not the cash. He still he doesn't steal money. No. Hmm. I'm not sure. Because then, like the very next scene, he's walking up a crazy, like concrete, up to a concrete bridge thing, and gets on the bus. This happened in daylight time. I thought he robbed the liquor store. No, at night. But then, like the next scene, he's getting yeah. on the bus. Yeah, I can't remember. Um, well, anyway, he gets on the bus. Yeah. Uh, and he, he has the kids like singing children's songs and then he's like, no one's leaving the bus anymore. And, and this is where I feel like the performance is especially like modern. Yeah. Um, I like, he's really tapping into something freaky. Yeah. And, and, and the way they film it, the way he's acting, the way the kids are acting, especially the bus driver being quietly oh, like so good. terrified but still having to do her job or else the kids are going to die. Um, it just, the tension, the tension ratchets up. Mm-hmm. They do pull over and he calls the police. Yeah. And demands ransom money again. And And this reminded me of in one of the Zodiac letters, the real Zodiac, he said... Something like, I could do this, I could do that. I could just sit there and sniper kids as they walk out of a bus. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure that's where they got this idea. Mm-hmm. Um, but go ahead, yeah. But yeah, at first, he like like you said, he's singing songs with the children. It, it's, the children have no idea uh-huh. what's happening, but where the bus is going, at a certain point, kids start, like, where are we going? Yeah. This isn't, uh-huh. I, I want to go home. Right. And this was like I was not expecting it to, to to be turned up to eleven. Yeah. Where he slaps the kid. Yeah. And it starts screaming at all the children. Or he starts he continues to scream at the children, sing, sing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It oh it was so gross. Yeah, but then in the distance, there's a man standing on a overpass like railroad. And then he's like Oh, no. And then we see Mr. Clint Eastwood jump onto the bus, a real stunt he performed. And then 
it's bus time with the boys. There was one cute shot where <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking eventually of that. Eventually, the bus he starts driving the bus, the killer. Uh huh. Um, and Clint Eastwood is or well, for, before that he's shooting up on the roof, uh-huh. trying to get hair dirty, Harry. <laughs> but then he starts driving the bus. <laughs> There's just like it just seemed cute for some reason, where he. Is driving the bus is pointing the gun out the windshield, and we see Harry's head like dip down. <laughs> I know, his, I know, with his gun, but like slowly, and they both like aim at each other for half a second, and then they both just slip away. Yeah, and <laughs> you you actually laughed when when that happened, <laughs> um, which was quite funny. Uh, and then they go to like a gravel mill or something. Yeah, you know, an old gravel mill. I liked this scene. It was cool. Yeah, the chase around was interesting. It was inventive. Yeah. Uh, it was not what I was expecting to happen. Yeah. Uh, so they go through this whole gravel thing. I do remember thing. all of this stuff. Okay, so previous... this is a part you had seen. Yeah. Um, And then there's a kid, like, fishing in the gravel area. Yeah. Which, funny enough, felt very, like, it just felt like, oh, one of these guys, like, had to bring their kid to work and was like, well, bring your fishing pole. <laughs> like, it just felt, like, all those little touches, all those extra people make the... It feels like a real world. It yeah. feels like our world. Um, and so then the killer grabs the kid. And then, of course, Harry does a classic, shoots his arm. He's got good aim. I wouldn't be able to do that. And uh, the kid gets away. He's able to do his do you feel lucky speech. And guess what? This time he's only shot five times. Blows him away. And then he pulls out his badge looks at it, takes it off, and th- tosses it into the pond. Yeah, and because it's a movie from 1971, the credits immediately start rolling after that yes. as he walks away. Yes, and we applaud and applaud. Yeah. Yeah, I. that's Dirty Harry for you. Yeah. What do you think, folks? They loved it, too. Uh, yeah, um, I'm excited to keep going through this series. We're going in blind for the rest of them. Uh, I have not seen the rest. Um, and yeah, thanks for listening to this podcast. Are we just going to end as abruptly as the movie did? Yeah. Okay. Uh, but well, with a couple of plugs, please remember to rate review and subscribe, uh, and send it to a friend. Um, and then finally, you know, I already talked about Patreon, uh, but next week, cause our calendar, I do have on the calendar that next week we are doing insidious, Five, Whoa. directed by Patrick Wilson. Yes, but I would imagine we probably won't be doing that. Oh, so go okay. to my Instagram at Out of Micah, uh, and you can see our schedule. So next week we will probably be doing the second Dirty Harry movie, Magnum Force. Who's to say? But I'm not sure. I Insidious is a movie I could see us being like. I know we just had a kid, but we got to go see Insidious. <laughs> no, probably not. That'd be crazy, right? It's probably pretty crazy. You know what? You know what? Folks, I'm taking it off the calendar because there's no reason for us to do that. So uh, next week it is Magnum Force, um, and and we'll 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 have to do Insidious later in the year, probably when it comes out on video and on demand. VOD. VOD. It's in the game. <laughs>